Hi folks, I'm Douglas Kruger, author of books like Poverty Proof, Is Your Thinking Keeping You Poor?, and the global new book Political Correctness Does More Harm Than Good. Let's talk about the idea of minimum wage. The incoming Biden administration is speaking about a $15 minimum wage. And this is an issue that many people struggle to understand. And we ask the question, how could that possibly do any harm? Why would it not help the poor? My field of study and what I like to write and speak about focuses on unpacking the kinds of philosophy that keep people stuck in intergenerational cycles of poverty. And minimum wage is a particularly interesting one in that it sounds so kind. And yet here are six ways in which it actually does great damage to the poorest of the poor. The first one is this. It increases the gap between zero and employment, so that less poor people begin to escape from extreme poverty. There are several excellent authors and economists on this particular topic. The Probably the best two are um, economic historian Dr. Thomas Sowell and a gentleman by the name of William Easterly, who wrote a book called The Tyranny of Experts. I would strongly recommend The Tyranny of Experts, which focuses on this one particular issue of government inter intervention into economies and how it actively harms the poorest of the poor. Here's a very simple explanation of how that goes. Dr. Thomas Sowell gives the example of what we would call a sweatshop in Southeast Asia. Now, the setup is this. You have an American corporation, big name brand, that sets up its offices, its workshops in Southeast Asia in a developing nation. And it hires people from very poor communities. And of course, because the laws there are quite lax in, in terms of, of labor laws, um, even young kids are allowed to work there. The West, viewing this from comfort and luxury, is horrified and lobbies and advocates to have it shut down, and they successfully did so. And in doing this, they missed several things. One, employment within that brand's so-called sweatshop was the highest paying option in that nation and in that community at the time. So they removed the highest paid option by taking away this small minimum wage option. And secondly, Dr. Thomas Sowell tracks what actually happened to those people. And a surprising number of the young women and the young children turned to prostitution as a result of having their only employment option taken away. This is what happens when you remove the, um, the ability to offer a low-wage job. You increase the gap between zero, absolute poverty, and the first rung of the ladder, and you make it harder to surmount that gap. That does extreme damage to the poorest of the poor. Number two, because it increases the gap between zero and employment, it, remo it removes an opportunity to get onto the ladder. The assumption is that by raising the minimum wage, you give people what they call a living wage, that this is what they can now do with their lives. The idea behind a low-paid job is that it is entrance into the game. It's, a, it's an open door. And it may be very low, but it's the beginning of an upward trajectory. And once again, as in point number one, you have moved, removed that first step. You've taken away that option. Number three, because it removes an opportunity to get onto the ladder, it also removes a means of learning basic work skills. And these include things like punctuality, time management, learning to cooperate in a team, interacting with customers and learning an attitude of customer service, which is the basis of all business, learning to cooperate in a team, um, leadership skills, rudimentary communication skills, and the specific skills implied within the job, including even simple things. I mean, if you take the, uh, the stereotypical flipping burgers and, and working at a, at a cash register, it's things like adding up bills and giving change. Now, those are skills you have to learn at the entry level before you can graduate to the next level. So you've not only taken away an employment option, you've taken away the only place where you might learn the skills necessary for the next level up. That's number three. Number four, it incentivizes the replacement of human beings with machines. Again, let's take that uh, classic example of a McDonald's. Over many thousands of stores, it's easy enough to pay relatively low wages, uh, and I'm not picking on McDonald's here, just, just an example, to pay low wages but to employ people. And it's actually financially worth it to do so. But if you change that 
if you impose minimum wage at scale over the course of thousands, tens of thousands of outlets, suddenly it's not worth it to employ human beings. So what do they do? They replace it with machines. The machine has a one-off cost. You pay for it once and it's done. You never have to pay the salary on an ongoing basis. So it is much cheaper to replace people with machines. And if you do so, you can offer your product cheaper and have higher profit margins. Every business has every incentive to do that. So now, you not only remove the opportunity for the poorest of the poor to begin, but you get the next level up, the folks who are on that level, fired. When you insist on that minimum wage, what companies do at scale is to fire the bottom level and to replace them with automation. The hiring at the bottom level is done, I don't mean to sound condescending in saying this, but it is done on a borderline of charity. It is a thing that makes sense for a business, but only just, and we may as well do it because it's worth it and it helps people. And a lot of companies, organizations and brands like McDonald's then offer employment and learning and growth options to those people at that level. But essentially, it would be much more worthwhile to replace them with automation. When you force the issue, they do. So now you've hurt the poorest of the poor by removing an opportunity and you've taken that entire bracket who are just starting to climb and fired them en masse. Number five, you make everything more expensive, which hurts who more than anyone else? Well, of course, it's right. It's the poorest of the poor. Take the example, simple example of bread. Bread is still very cheap in most places around the world. And that means that it has terrifically small, incredibly tight margins. But it's manageable. And those who sell bread can still make a profit. Add minimum wage at every stage, every stage of production, and suddenly those margins disappear. So either the bread making company itself now disappears, or the more logical option, what they actually do is they raise the prices all around. So what happens now is the price of everything that had small margins must go up because you have imposed a minimum wage at every level in every industry. So the very, very few poor people who do successfully get minimum wage and aren't fired or replaced with automation suddenly discover that all the most basic things are more expensive, which negates the benefit of that minimum wage rise in the first instance. So it becomes a zero-sum game. You decimate the poorest of the poor, you get the next level up fired en masse, and the very few who do remain and get their minimum wage suddenly discover that it's irrelevant because all the things that they needed are now equally more expensive in tandem. And number six, there's the broader principle behind this. Other than upholding laws and contracts, government into the interference into the economy always always does more harm than good. I'll give you four quick examples of that one. The Great Depression. Economists now estimate that if the US government had done nothing, absolutely nothing, just left it alone, they would have shortened the Great Depression by seven years. Seven years of starvation and suffering as a result of government meddling. There are many complex reasons for that, the most simple of which is this. Businesses require certainty. When you keep tinkering with the rules and changing things and experimenting and putting more money into the economy and then making some things more expensive and mandating things, the more you interfere, the less certainty there is. So businesses wait. They wait and see. And that prolongs depression. If they'd done nothing, it would have been seven years shorter. Number two, the war on poverty in the United States is a fabulous example of this one. Black economic empowerment in the United States, coming out of emancipation and going up until the 1960s, was on a sharp upward trajectory. Black wealth and ownership of property and economic options were rising in tandem with their expanding freedoms and expanding liberties. Then the Johnson administration stepped in and said, what we're going to do is declare war on poverty, and they massively expanded the social welfare state. Black wealth went from this great expansion to halting dead in its tracks. It stopped 
dead at that level of development. And of course there are simple reasons for that. For example, the incentivizing of young girls to wed the state, to fall pregnant and become uh, dependent on the state. And they are equally incentivized not to have a husband in the picture, because then you don't get the grant. This decimates the community, decimates the family, and does great damage to what was growing wealth. Probably the best known example of this one globally is New Zealand. Around 1952-1953, New Zealand was one of the wealthiest per capita of the developed nations. Then they brought in immense government regulation. They regulated the living daylights out of everything. And New Zealand dropped from its place as one of the wealthiest nations with the highest standards of living to the lowest standard of living and lowest wealth of any first world nation in the world, then a very famous economist um, in their uh, in their nation, uh, they actually call it Rogenomics to this day, came in and scrapped all of these things. He just freed it up and freed it up and freed it up. And what happened as a result of that was New Zealand went right back up to becoming one of the world's leading nations in terms of GDP and standards of living. So just a remarkable example of government does something, gets worse. Government does nothing, gets better. And that principle applies to minimum wage. There are many other examples. I mean, just for example, under uh, President Ronald Reagan in the United States, there were the beginnings of a financial market wobble, the beginnings of a small depression. And everyone urged him to do something, and he resolutely refused to do so. Thomas Sowell then says, as a result of not doing anything, what followed was 20 years of growth, a 20-year period of economic prosperity. Um, in my own nation, South Africa, we see this. We are one of the BRICS nations comparable to an emerging nation like India. India has been repealing the restrictions on business and their economy has been flourishing. In South Africa, our freedom to do business index rating has been plummeting and we are going backwards. So the broad principle is that other than upholding rule of law and honoring contracts, government interference into economies does more harm than good. So folks, I think we all agree on the goal. The goal is to help people. The goal is to help people out of poverty. We want to break these generational cycles of poverty and make sure that people prosper. Is the minimum wage a good way to do that? No, the results are actually horrific. I talk about things like this in Political Correctness Does More Harm Than Good, and in the new book that just launched this week, titled How to Grow Rich, and subtitled 50 Ways to Debunk Money Myths and Master Wealth. My goal is to help people escape these generational cycles of poverty, and most of it has to do with the thinking, the philosophy that goes into designing the way people work and the way people generate wealth. If the sort of content interests you, please do subscribe to the channel. Please do feel free to share it. And I have and you have a vested interest in ensuring that the best ideas prevail. We want to make sure that our children, our communities, and the nations around us grow in prosperity and that they do not get mired down in policies that promote poverty.